<clears throat> You're live. Hello and welcome to this author interview. This is Conversations with Dr. Bachner, and this is Howard Bachner, editor in chief of JAMA. I'm joined today by uh, Doug White, who's a professor of critical care medicine, medicine and clinical and translational science, vice chair for faculty development, and uh, holds a UPMC endowed chair for ethics and critical care medicine. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today, Doug. Thanks so much for having me. So um, it's going to be one of the you know more emotionally difficult uh, uh, live streams podcasts I've done. Uh, we're going to be talking about your your viewpoint that uh, was just published an hour ago uh, on the JAMA website entitled The Framework for Rationing Ventilators in Critical Care Beds During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So, um, And you've written it with Bernie Lowe. So before we get started and talk about uh, the viewpoint, uh, Doug, could you say a little bit about your co-author, Bernie Lowe? Uh, so Bernie is uh, uh, an ethicist and a general internal medicine physician at UCSF who has been uh, an incredible leader in bioethics for uh, a number of decades uh, and is just a, a fantastic collaborator. Now, uh, you're a bit different than most people who write about it because you're both an in ethicist and an intensivist. You're actually a practicing critical care physician. How did you combine these two disciplines? Well, when I was in training, uh, I, I had both a, a, an interest in really uh, rigorous empirical research and was also drawn to the, the questions that, that had, I, I would say, a social sciences and ethical bent. And, uh, you know, my mentors at UCSF really pushed me to, to pursue the work uh, and pursue bridging ethics and translational work for, uh, for medicine. Now, rationing in different ways by access, by income, has always occurred in the United States. But I think what we're facing with a COVID-19 pandemic is something really quite, quite unique. It's been on the front page of many newspapers. It's certainly increasingly widely discussed in part because of what's occurring in New York City and the concern about whether or not there's a sufficient number of, of ventilators. Uh, we certainly know there's not a sufficient uh, amount of ongoing testing or PPE equipment, but the focus today is going to be on ventilators and, and critical care beds. Before we walk through uh, the viewpoint, and then more importantly, you, you have helped with a number of people co-author an executive summary, which represents the framework that's being adopted nationwide around this issue, and that's why I thought it's so important to talk with you about it. But how do, you, how do you think of rationing in the broader sense before we talk about it more specifically around ventilators and critical care beds? Well, so, I, you know, I think one of the key um, sort of organizing principles around where we are now is this notion that uh, we're in the midst of a public health emergency. And so that uh, moment is really a trigger for some changes in the ethical framework that drive decisions. Uh, so, for example, in traditional uh, medical ethics, the physician's obligation is really to the, the well-being of the individual patient in front of him or her, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to, to do the best that he can or she can for, for the patient, and then also respecting the patient's uh, well-informed preferences about which treatments to receive. But in a public health emergency, the ethics shifts from that individual patient focus to a focus on uh, trying to maximize the, the, the well-being and the outcomes in populations of patients. And so that, that can entail some really different ways of making decisions in terms of uh, there are certain circumstances in which uh, what you might do to, to maximize the benefit for an individual patient simply can't be done because of the impact it would have on populations of patients. Now let's walk through the viewpoint, and then I'd also like to walk through the, the, um, the, the document that you and others have produced, which is entitled, just so that people know, Allocation of Scarce Critical Care Resources During a Public Health Emergency, the Executive Summary. There's a URL that goes to that document uh, on the JAMA website. But let's, let's walk through the, the, the JAMA viewpoint. And before we start, I just want to mention that simultaneously we, we're publishing a viewpoint by Randy Curtis, another intensivist from uh, Seattle, who, along with Aaron Cross and Renee Stapleton, have written a viewpoint entitled The Importance of Addressing Advanced Care Planning and Decisions About Do Not Resuscitate Orders During Novel Coronavirus 2019. That, that's a separate viewpoint, but I think it, 
it does obviously blend into some of the things we're going to talk about. So let's talk about your viewpoint. The first section that you talk about is entitled categorically excluding large groups of patients from receiving mechanical ventilation is ethically problematic. Could you talk about that concept? Yeah. So um, some of the earliest work uh, done on this topic of how to, how to triage and ration ventilators and ICU beds uh, came from a professional society task force on mass critical care. Uh, and there were a number of ethical red flags that came out of the guidance that they first released back in 2008. And then there's a, uh, um, an updated uh, framework released in 2014. And I would say the biggest red flag has to do uh, with some provisions in the guidelines that simply exclude large groups of patients from any access to ICU care. For example, um, patients with moderate uh, to severe heart failure or lung disease are excluded uh, or recommended to be excluded. Um, individuals with cancer that has metastasized, patients with cognitive impairment, uh, and also the, the, those with advanced age, so the very elderly. And we just felt that it was uh, critically important to propose a triage strategy that didn't use exclusion criteria. Uh, and so in 2009, I convened a group of ethicists and public health experts, and we really worked on this idea of, is it feasible to put together triage uh, guidelines that don't exclude groups of patients? Yeah, I, I know like I know unlike uh, other people who have really important uh, views on this issue and comments, you've been working on this for a long time. This is not uh, a novel situation for you. You've tried to think about it well before this pandemic. The second section of the viewpoint is entitled, it is ethically insufficient to solely focus on survival to hospital discharge. Can you comment about that section? Yeah, so... Uh I think many people's moral intuition would uh, yield a conclusion that just getting the, the most number of patients out of the ICU uh, is not enough. It's, it's not a, a broad enough way to think about it. You know, if, if these patients, if we're getting them out of the ICU and they have weeks or months left to live, uh, or that may just really not capture all the things that we think are important. And so the idea here is that there's really no single principle that's adequate that adequately captures the values we want to take into account when we make these decisions. And so we advocated for incorporating multiple criteria as we determine how to achieve the greatest good for the greatest numbers. And those those criteria um, certainly involve survival to hospital discharge. And that and that is, in fact, uh, one of the two main criteria that we propose. But the other is uh, focusing on trying to maximize the quality of, uh, so, uh, sorry, the number of life years gained. And so th that already you see that there, there are two competing uh, criteria that need to be put into play. And the framework we developed is essentially a point system that's not unlike, for example, the lung allocation score for lungs for transplantation in the United States, but yields a one to eight score with uh, one being folks who have the most likely uh, uh, survival to hospital discharge and life years gained, and eight being those who have almost no chance of surviving to hospital discharge uh, and, and accruing life years. And the idea, and I just want to sort of say it again, that what's important about this, this framework this, and this allocation scheme is that every patient who would normally be eligible for intensive care is considered and is uh, given an allocation score. No one's excluded. And the idea is instead that we would treat with intensive care as many patients as we could in terms of the resources available. And so it's, it's really the, the provision of intensive care is resource driven rather than exclusion driven. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the lung scoring system. Were there other models that you could draw on to help you as you created your framework? Well, I, I think actually various uh, frameworks for organ allocation provide uh, proof of principle that you can efficiently incorporate multiple ethical considerations into making allocation decisions. And so, so we, we looked extensively to different models in, in the organ transplantation community. And the lung allocation framework was the one that we thought really best captured this notion that we both want to save the most lives and we want to maximize the numbers, number of ye life years saved after, uh, for example, discharge from the hospital. Now the the third section in the viewpoint. Then we'll go. Uh, we'll return to the to the document that you've produced. And I think if and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, ha, has been endorsed by a number of hospitals. Uh, 
The, the third section of the viewpoint is recommendations for a multi-principal allocation framework. Is that in part what you were just mentioning? Exactly, yes. And then the last, more guideline, more guidance is needed uh, on withdrawing life support from one patient to provide it to another. Some regards, that, that, that's in part um, uh, what Randy talks about uh, in, in his viewpoint, is the need for people to really be conscious of discussing end-of-life decisions and, and do not resuscitate now before uh, individuals get hospitalized. But can you talk about this, more guidance needed for withdrawing life support? Sure. First, the, the, the point that, that Randy uh, and Aaron and, and uh, Renee raised in their viewpoint is critically important. This idea that uh, we may, I guess the first step before we even get to triage and rationing is to make sure that we're engaging patients to really understand what are their preferences for life support or not in the, in the setting of advanced illness. And so, so I, I just want to highlight that the first step here before we get to this really dire uh, worst case scenario of rationing should be intensive, careful, skilled goals of care conversations. But yep. Go ahead. If I apologize. There, yeah, no, no, no. I think, you know, if, if we get to a point where there are uh, far more patients who need ventilation uh, than there are ventilators, um, there will not only need to be what we call upfront triage, you know, picking from among the patients presenting every day who are the most likely to benefit, but there will also need to be reassessment of the patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation and intensive care to see are they actually improving or has their prognosis worsened so much that, that they actually have a, a substantially worse prognosis than people who are in the queue for a ventilator, for example. And if that's the case, then there really, there does and when would need to be withdrawal of life support from the patients who are receiving mechanical ventilation but have a, a poor prognosis in order to give it to patients who are waiting and have a better prognosis. Now, I think, I think for people who aren't uh, physicians or clinicians in the intensive care unit, that's not novel for the intensive care unit. There, after someone's been on a ventilator and they've been on it for a long period of time, there are decisions made about how long someone can remain on a ventilator. That wouldn't be unique to this situation, would it? Uh, the notion of withdrawing life support is certainly well accepted. What's different about this situation is that, and this is the part that's really hard for people, both for the initial triage and the subsequent, is that these potentially would be decisions to withdraw life support number one, against the objections of patients and families, and number two, in the context of patients who might actually have some uh, real chance of surviving, but their prognosis is actually a bit worse or substantially worse than people who are waiting. Can you say a little bit about this document that you've developed? I know with other people, but you've been the principal architect of it. Uh, I'm looking at the entire document. There's an executive summary, but before we go through the details of it, could you say a little bit about it and how it how it came to be, how it's being uh, utilized, how you're distributing it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, six or eight weeks ago, when things were really uh, beginning to go sideways in China, uh, and then more recently with what's happened in Italy, a number of institutions reached out to me and asked about the 2009 framework uh, uh, for the multi principal allocation framework that we published and really asked, you know, have you, are you guys using this? Have you incorporated this into a hospital policy? And if so, can you please send it to us? Because this is what we'd like to use, but we haven't written a policy and time is very tight. And so um, this, this happened simultaneous with UPMC, uh, which is the, the health system in which I work. It's a 40 hospital health system. They asked, uh, uh, similarly, can we develop uh, an allocation framework and a hospital policy that can be used across all the health uh, all the hospitals in the health system. And so I, I essentially um, took the framework that we developed in 2009 and incorporated some really uh, wonderful public engagement work that Lee Daugherty Bittison uh, and Eric Toner, some of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, did over the last five or eight years and condensed all of that uh, from th this sort of broad ethical framework down into a very operational practical step-by-step -step recipe that hospitals could essentially cut and paste into whatever format they need and use as the framework their hospital uses. I do appreciate my ethical colleagues, but sometimes their conver the conversations are so elusive I can't really uh, 
sort out if we're getting to a decision. And here, the, the, the struggles to come may be that we do have to make very, very difficult decisions. Do you have any sense, uh, Doug, do you have any sense about whether or not any of this uh, approach has been used in Italy? So I, I, it's not, things that have happened in Italy have been a bit opaque. Uh, it's not entirely clear. Uh, it, well, I guess what I should say is it, it is quite clear that rationing decisions were made. Um, it's not entirely clear on what principles those decisions were made. And so I'm, you know, I have great respect for my colleagues there who are doing incredible work. And so I think that as a starting point, we should give them the benefit of the doubt about how they've been making these decisions. But it's but it's clear that these decisions have been being made. Yeah, well, I, I think people know I've commented before, my respect for Maurizio Sacconi is o overwhelming. I think his um, live stream podcast, now with over a million views, galvanized much of the world to say... I be prepared. So uh, uh, there, Absolutely. but for the grace of God, go I. I, I yeah. I, Howard, I, can I, I just say that I listened to that podcast too, and it was um, it was really sobering to hear this, uh, to hear Mauricio describe one hospital, yeah. you know, the size of most academic hospitals in the United States, getting 50 to 70 patients with acute respiratory failure every day. I mean, that number is uh, it is staggering. It, it, I mean, it, it puts such a, a salient frame on the thing that we might be confronted with. And I, I do think you're right that it, it galvanized a lot of people to say, holy crap, we, we need to be ready for this. Yeah. You know, I think there's been key moments. I've said it again. My heroes, Fauci, uh, Maurizio, actually, uh, I've been impressed at the NBA closed so quickly. And then, of course, healthcare workers. But, I, you know, I think there was a tipping point when the U.S. finally uh, came to 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 realize that uh, there was a potential tsunami coming. Obviously, it it has struck New York City, and I I hope it's confined to New York City. Um, Doug, um, wh when you think so, how is the document being used at the moment? From your for, what's your sense of how this document is being used, and then we'll go through some of the details of it. Uh, yeah, so I I want to uh, first say a couple things about Pennsylvania. Um, the the framework has been adopted at UPMC, as I said, a 40 hospital health system. Penn uh, and Penn State have also adopted it. And then I think most importantly, earlier this week on, on Tuesday, actually, March 22nd, the state of Pennsylvania adopted this approach as the, the recommended approach for all hospitals in Pennsylvania. And then I also want to give a, a, a really big shout out to my friend and colleague, Scott Halpern, who has been uh, an incredible partner in uh, m moving this from something that we've been focusing on in Pennsylvania to making it something that is now being looked at at what what looks to be uh, many hundreds of hospitals in the United States as well as a number of hospitals uh, uh, internationally. Where's so, Scott? You know, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, where's Scott? Scott's at Penn. That's right. I just wanted to make sure people knew that. Okay. Yeah, and so you know, so, uh, I I'm a luddite in the sense that I'm not on social media, and so Scott. Uh, took this uh, to Twitter and it, things really, uh, uh, really blew up. I'm going to avoid the expression went viral. Um, they it, it just, it was really remarkable how quickly uh, people contacted us. And so we, we eventually just in the last couple of days have posted it on uh, the ccm.pit.edu website. It's the first thing that pop, pops up if you go to ccm.pit.edu. And it looks like just in the last couple of days, we've had uh, well over a thousand uh, downloads of the document. As I said, it's linked to now through through your your piece in JAMA, and we'll send we'll send it out through social media. So let's talk about uh, this document. It has three sections. We'll walk through each one: creation yep. of triage teams, allocation criteria for ICU admission and ventilation, and then reassessment for ongoing provision of critical care ventilation. And if some of this overlaps, obviously, with the viewpoint. But can you talk about creation of triage teams? So this notion of, of triage teams is uh, is deeply ingrained in disaster medicine, and I think it is um, it is a crucial step in the process of hospitals getting ready for the, the potential need to triage and to reallocate ventilators. And so what it involves is essentially a, a general principle that treating physicians will not be making triage decisions. You know, the, the concern with that approach is the individual treating physician generally has ethical obligations to his or her 
uh, patients that are that are right in front. Uh, and, and treating docs are also knee deep in just sort of keeping patients alive. And so the idea here is that there needs to be a separate team who are the ones who are making triage decisions with what we call situational awareness, which is to say they have a view not just of the few patients in you know this unit or this unit, but they see all of the units in the hospital. And, and more broadly, they see what's happening with bed availability in the region so that if hospital A has uh, all their beds are filled and they have 10 patients with respiratory failure in their ED, but hospital B has 10 open beds, that they there wouldn't be a, a triage to palliative care for only for that for the patients at hospital A. Instead, they would be transferred to hospital B. So that you know we're looking at the region level for how to make sure that patients are getting the care they need. But the idea is that the, the triage team would be uh, Cal would be having the scores calculated uh, that we'll talk about in a minute and would be making these high level judgments about which are the patients who are most likely to benefit. If there's ever been a more important time for hospitals to cooperate with one another, I can't uh, uh, remember it in my lifetime. I, I was talking to Bob Vince, who's chair of pediatrics at BMC, my old haunting ground, and, and Bob mentioned yeah. that BMC had actually lent ventilators, I think, to the Brigham, because they, the BMC had them and the Brigham didn't, and they needed more. And I would hope to see more of that at, at the regional level. The second section is allocation criteria for ICU admission and ventilation. Yes, and this is, you know, this is essentially just what we talked about, which is the, the, alloc the one to eight score uh, that's focused primarily, and there, there are primary and secondary considerations, and we didn't dig down on the secondary, but I think they're worth talking about. So just to re remind folks, the, the primary considerations are uh, maximizing, to maximizing survival to hospital discharge and maximizing life years saved. And those are operationalized by some sort of a severity of illness score, like the SOFA score. But we've left this open because I think there's real uncertainty right now about what uh, risk prediction model will be most accurately predictive of outcomes with this particular disease. And it's, it's quite likely that things will be in flux over the next weeks and months. And as new information comes in, we should incorporate that into our allocation framework. And then the second part of the uh, scoring system, as I said, is the, the chronic comorbidities, where points are given for essentially severe comorbidities that are life limiting. Uh, and I want to draw a distinction here. You know, so. We are not, as I said, we're not excluding any patients from access to ICU care. Instead, we're trying to prioritize those patients most likely to benefit without excluding anyone. So that if you know suddenly a thousand new ventilators become available in a region, there's no one who's sitting in this excluded category. Instead, everyone has a priority score, and if all these ventilators come online, then these patients would all still be eligible to receive it. And Does then, that, go ahead. Howard, should, we, should we talk about the second level? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. I, I, you know, um, I think most of the people who are listening uh, are really interested in the topic. It's hopefully it won't come to pass. That, exactly. That, 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 that's what I'm hoping. I'm impressed that you thought ahead. You know, there are so many aspects of uh, this pandemic in which we in which we, the healthcare system, the U.S. government, did not look ahead. I'm impressed that you did look ahead. So, yeah, talk a little bit about the secondary level of uh, uh, yeah. uh, Im important factors. Yeah, um, I should, if I if I could, just take a small tangent to say that you know the work that a, a number of groups, including the Mass Task Force for Critical Care, have been doing to make sure that hospitals know how to avoid these situations, if at all possible, by increasing what we call surge capacity yeah. is, is critically important. You know, we wanna do whatever we can to essentially you know, not be on the Titanic and not hit the iceberg right, avoid and steer around it. And so I just, I wanna give a shout out to that group for doing amazing work on, on the, the sort of operational details that hospitals can just follow to, to move their ICU capacity up you know, 40, 50%. Okay, so, so these secondary criteria. Um, let's just sort of hypothetically imagine that uh, you're, in an IC, you're in an ER or an ICU and you've got one last ventilator. And I, I know it's a little trite and to think about it in that way, but it is a good thought experiment. You've got one last ventilator and you have, uh, let's say, three patients who, who uh, all have acute respiratory failure. Uh, and let's say that they all have identical severity of illness and they all, let's say, just say they lack any comorbidities that would get them any points. Uh, 
So essentially, let's say they all have a score of two on the um, raw priority score. This leaves a dilemma because if you have one ventilator and three people who look identical, uh, there's, no, there's no clear way to break that tie. And so what we proposed is that that tie can be broken uh, with a couple, a, a number of things. Uh, one is called the life cycle principle, which is to say all other things equal, priority should go to those who have had the least chance to live through life, which is to say those who are younger rather than those, those who are older. So for example, if one of, the, one of those three patients was 20 and the other two were elderly, uh, I think there's a very strong argument to say priority should go to the younger patient, not because the younger patient has any more intrinsic worth or social value, but because they're the worst off in the sense that they've had the least chance to live through life. So that's, that's the first tiebreaker. And the second, uh, which could either be incorporated as a tiebreaker or, for example, uh, subtracting points from the priority score, is um, what, what we call critical worker status. And so the idea here is that it, it may further the goals of the public health response to give priority to some individuals who are critical to saving other lives. And so this could be, uh, you know, the, the cleanest example is people who work in, on the healthcare response. And I don't mean just doctors, I mean nurses and respiratory therapists, uh, the individuals who clean the rooms between patients who are discharged and admitted from an ICU. All of these people, it, it, and it's not that they are, um, that they have broad, more broad social worth. It's this very narrow concept that we think of as, as instrumental value. By prioritizing these individuals, we may actually um, augment the response of the healthcare system and save more lives. And then I would just say the last part of that, um, that health prioritizing uh, critical workers is also this notion that while, while many of us are, you know, uh, kind of locked down at home, there, there is this group of people who are, uh, you know, running to the hospital to help other people and, and taking on some n not insignificant risk to themselves. And so there's a, a potential notion of reciprocity that for the risks that these individuals are taking, the health system should put in place at least some assurances that they'll be taken care of if they get sick because of their, their efforts. Yeah, well, uh, there's some questions that come in that I'll get to, but I am, I'm hoping we could talk a little bit at the end about rationing regarding testing PPEs and uh, wearing of masks. I, I've been increasingly disturbed about the reports about who's getting tested and who isn't, but we'll, we'll come back to that. The third aspect uh, of the document is reassessment for ongoing provision of critical care or ventilation. Yeah, say, say, so, Howard, this is... You know, we just talked about this. We there's a big part of this in the in the uh, the, the viewpoint. In the viewpoint, yeah. And it's just I, I think just to emphasize, this is the you know this is the notion that um, there will likely need to be situations in which ventilators are, are withdrawn from patients who have a very poor prognosis uh, in order to give it to others. But he, so here's the the truly difficult part of that, which is that this particular COVID nineteen illness is proving itself to be one that requires a fairly long duration yeah. of mechanical ventilation for improvement. And so I, I think it's it's really important that when individuals are thinking about, well, so, so when do we start this reassessment process, that it not be too early. You know, I, I think in, in the first 72 hours or, or even in the first 96 hours, it, it may well be too early to even get a signal that starts to separate the survivors from those who are going to die. And, you know, this is, I think we should just acknowledge, this is uh, a potentially really challenging uh, aspect of this for which we don't have good empirical data right now. And so, you know, I, I think we will likely need to err on the side of longer trials uh, rather than shorter. Yeah, when I spoke to Michelle Gong last week, um, I asked her what are some of the unusual clinical experience that her team has had, and she said it's the length of ventilation that, you sure. know, the three, four, five days is actually seven, eight, or nine, or ten days. And I think there's some reports from Italy that the prone position has been yeah. really helpful in, in ventilation. So um, it will be interesting to see if we can develop some modeling early on to give uh, to give th this approach help. Right. Um, Doug, could we, uh, a, a, t a couple questions are coming through. The U.S. is filled with uh, very interesting cultural and religious backgrounds. And, uh, you, you know, uh, I'm not sure all cultures 
uh, view some of these issues in the same way. H how do how do intensivists interact with people from very varied uh, backgrounds in terms of uh, the the ethics of of this document yeah. or this approach, but but that the cultural underpinnings of a group could be very different. Sure. Well, uh, so this is absolutely the case. Um, what I'll say is that um, there was a very extensive community engagement effort to take these principles to community members, both in inner, uh, inner city areas and in rural communities, and essentially uh, lay it out for them and say, you know, here's the dilemma we're facing. How do you think we should make these decisions? And again, this is work uh, that was done uh, by Lee Daugherty Bittison and Eric Toner and colleagues uh, out of Hopkins, uh, I think in 2012 to 2015. It was an amazing effort. You know, this was not sort of a, we're going to send you a, a, a survey or do a telephone interview with you. They brought individuals together for day-long deliberative uh, sessions in which individuals, the, the, the community members had read lots of information in advance that was prepared for them. And then they had uh, experts really give them uh, brief, approachable summaries of the core issues. And then there were multiple periods of deliberation after which the public voted. And the, the, the output of that was a very strong endorsement of this notion uh, of the, the multi-principle framework that, uh, that we have uh, presented and published. Turning to uh, what I had suggested I wanted to, to understand is, you had mentioned, um, I forgot the term you used, um, giving some priority people who have contributed to the system that's kept people uh, alive or, or work in the intensive care unit, uh, yeah. you know, uh, instrumental value. Thank you. Um, how, how do you think about that vis-a-vis -vis testing where it still seems like it's, you know, rapid testing seems to be elusive in some places. Yeah. And as Michelle made clear in last week's live stream is critical to the logistical and organizational uh, tasks that that uh, people like you and, and Derek and all of the intensivists and care providers at UPMC may face, that without it, it, it really paralyzes systems. And then, uh, obviously, the shortage around PPE. So testing and PPE yeah. in, in this yeah. kind of ra rationing um, concepts, how do you think about it? Right. Well, so I think many of us have seen... Uh, evidence that the wealthy and well-connected seem to be getting tested when uh, many of the rest of us, if we needed to, uh, would not be. And that, that obviously raises real concerns about fairness. Um, you know, if we think about this from a very narrow standpoint of what, what can we do to maximize the chances that, number one, there are healthcare providers available, and two, that we minimize the spread of this disease, I think there are, there are very clear reasons to um, continue to restrict the testing, not to individuals who are, have a sniffle and are concerned, but to people who, who have you know, really clear signs and symptoms of the disease so that we can uh, quickly get a, a, a result and have them quarantined uh, a, a, appropriately so they are not spreading this disease to others without knowing it. Yeah, you know, I've said repeatedly, it would be great if you could double or triple the number of, of ICU beds and ventilators, but if you don't have enough people to work, it's not going to be yep. very uh, meaningful. And it's very clear that in this disease, it appears as though more healthcare workers are getting infected than with other types of epidemics. It's a bit unclear why, but it's very clear it is happening. And I'm wondering, it's just because of the logistic nightmares that organizations have faced, the lack of PPE and then potentially not being able to understand whether a patient is infected or not infected. I don't know if you have anything that you, th you think may be con contributing to why it appears so many healthcare workers are indeed in getting infected. Well, it's, right. So, uh, you know, a bit of information has come out about the, um, about the clinical or actually, actually about the, the characteristics of the virus in the sense that it, yeah, patients are contagious before they're symptomatic. And, and obviously that is a recipe for uh, aggressive spread and the, this R naught number being very big. Um, now what to do about that is, is tricky because we're also confronting a shortage of PPEs. And so, you know, you think about patients and, and, and healthcare workers in urgent care clinics no. and primary care offices and, e and ERs, they are 
um, in, a, in a very difficult circumstance because a number of the patients that they're just going to be seeing day to day um, may actually be asymptomatic and still spreading the disease. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I was struck. I, I spoke to my son and he said, well, one of his friends likes chefing and he badly cut his finger just last sure. week and he had to go to one of the hospitals in New York and they made him put on PPE uh, a, a PPE outfit so that he wouldn't infect anyone else because he needed to be sutured. So again, use, uh, use of the material when it was necessary, but on the other hand, you can see how we're running short. A couple questions. Is it ethical to try to double ventilate on a single mm. ventilator knowing that this may be harmful to some patients? I'm not sure I understand the concept. I'm sure you do. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, just in the last few days, it has got caught the, the public uh, attention that maybe there are ways to put two patients on one ventilator or three patients on one ventilator. Um, I guess I would just say right now, that from a technology standpoint, this is not something that most hospitals will know how to do. And so I don't think we should be, there should be anyone in power tweeting that the way to sort this out is to just give the ventilator to four people at once, because it's not really a solution yet. Uh, maybe we'll get there, uh, but but each patient, you know, the, the the physiology of acute respiratory failure is different from patient to patient. You know, some patients have really stiff stiff lungs, and and other patients need lots of oxygen, uh, and some patients have really um, compliant lungs, and so it is an incredible uh, calculus problem to try to figure out how to appropriately ventilate individuals who have different lung characteristics with one ventilator. And I, I think I would leave it at there leave it at that point now and, and say, you know, it would be great to see this developed, but th we are not there yet. Um, it's very clear that uh, hospitals, nursing homes, skilled nursing homes are dramatically reducing uh, visitors in and out uh, appropriately. Uh, I mean, the yeah. risk, the risk if someone is has unknown status is just tremendous. But if you're in the intensive care unit and, and, and someone is dying and they're COVID ID 19 positive, um, what do you envision will happen towards the end of life? Yeah. Well, I, I must say that this is one of the um, more sad aspects of this disease uh, and, and the constellation of things that are happening right now, which is to say the shortages of PPE, the uncertainty about carrier status. All of this has led to situations in which um, there may well be patients who are dying in ICUs and their families can't visit them either because they're, they're being self-quarantined or because the hospital uh, doesn't have enough PPE right. to, uh, to broadly give it out. Um, my, my, my friend and colleague Randy Curtis at UW has, has confronted this and has written about it, and, and I think his suggestions are really excellent. Um, there are, are two main things I would suggest if there is a patient who is in respiratory isolation and families can't be with them at the bedside or, or, or it's, we're having challenges to get them to the bedside. It, the, the less good option is that hospitals should be working to set up essentially teleconferencing or video conferencing ability so that these families can at least ho hold what I might think of as a remote bedside vigil to be able to see the patient. But more importantly, I think that for patients who are dying, and it's pretty clear that they're dying, I, I think we should have something akin to uh, a compassionate use exception for PPE, where some family members are given PPE um, in, in the patient's um, final days and allowed to be at the bedside. And I, I absolutely get that um, if we are really short on PPE, this may be problematic. And yet I think it's worth just sort of thinking about for these few patients in whom the doctors are saying they're dying. It, they're really dying. There's nothing more we can do. Trying to do something to, to allow the family to, to be with the patient and have some, uh, some closure. This is Howard Bachner. We've been doing conversations with Dr. Bachner. Not surprising, this has been the longest of my live streams. I've been talking to uh, Doug White, who's a professor of critical care medicine at UPMC, where he holds the endowed chair for ethics and critical care medicine. Obviously, from this conversation, he's extraordinarily well qualified to have talked about this and write for JAMA. We, we've just put up two viewpoints, the first by Randy Curtis, Aaron Cross, and Renee Stapleton entitled The Importance of Addressing Advanced Care Planning and Decisions About Do Not Resuscitate Orders During Novel Coronavirus 2019, COVID-ID-19 
and the one by Doug and my good colleague, uh, Bernie Lowe, a framework for rationing ventilators in critical care beds during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Doug, uh, thank you for your work for the last six weeks. You're eminently qualified to have written for us, and you've spent so many years thinking this through. And I think as both an ethicist and an intensivist, you touch it in ways that perhaps other people don't. Uh, thanks mm. so much for joining me today, Doug. Yeah. Howard, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. See you. All right. I think we're.